Ladies and gentlemen, my dear audience, I am your host, Bins, and welcome back to the Breast Mam series. I hope you had a good night's rest, because after two episodes that I kept lightweight on purpose just to get your gears oiled a little, today we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty bitty of it all, the decoder. In a normal make anything machine in this game, the main challenge and focus is on your production lines. Which sources do you require? How do you organize them spatially on the map? How do you handle inputs, assemble painter arrays, stacking units, etc. But in a true make anything machine, that focus moves almost exclusively to your wiring. The main challenge becomes figuring out what your production lines need to produce in the first place. Coming up with an algorithm that lets you figure out how the target shape can be produced to begin with and then building wiring setups that perform those logical operations for you, that is by far the biggest chunk of work. Once you have that done, building the actual factory becomes a piece of cake in comparison. Not that building the factory doesn't pose any challenges of its own, don't get me wrong, but if you analyze the total time spent on building a team M from A to Z, then I'd say about 90% of it is spent on the decoder alone. Once you have a functional decoder, getting the actual factory built feels like nothing more than an easy breezy downhill ride straight to the finish in comparison. Now, as I already showed you in the first episode of this series, the Breast Mams decoder is absolutely humongous. It's by far the biggest chunk of wires that I've ever thrown into a pile hoping that something functional would come out of it. It's so big that if I zoom out like now, the individual units become less than a pixel in size, which is why, you know, some bits of it look emptier than others. But don't worry, that's just visuals, all right? All the units are there. So, where do we begin? Well, the answer actually is not entirely straightforward. Because, in my opinion, if I want to explain how the Breast Mams decoder works and what it does, it only makes sense to do so if you also understand why it performs those exact operations and why those operations would make sense. In turn, we need to understand how this new algorithm improves that of the Beast Mams decoder and well, in order to explain that, we need to know which part of the Beast Mams decoder left room for improvement, alright? So, perhaps a bit ironically, in this video series about my second Shapes Industries TMAM, today I actually want to talk about my first factory again. Now, I feel like it's pretty vital that you have a fairly good understanding of the processes that take place in the Beast Mams decoder and how they contribute to obtaining the desired outcome. So again, if you haven't seen the Beast Mam series, please watch it first, especially the parts about the decoder. Because in the Beast Mam series, I don't talk about the gaps that leave room for improvement. I only talk about how it works, not about how it doesn't work. And for a small part, that's on me because my ego got in the way. But for the biggest part, I simply wasn't capable of identifying those flaws at the time the way I can today. It's only when you understand how something works that you can understand how it can be improved, right? But this video is going to assume that the former part of that statement about how the decoder works, that you have that under your belt. The latter part about where the room for improvement is in the Beast Mam, that's where I want to pick up the story today. So as a matter of fact, I'm going to close this save game and open up the Beast Mam save again. Just a sec. Ah, yes, the Beast Mam decoder with its majestic five clocks. So, let's remind ourselves about the types of floating pieces that exist, because those are going to get pretty darn important. There are six types of those floating pieces. Firstly, 
pieces with a height of two layers that have base layer one, then pieces with a height of two layers that have base layer two, pieces with a height of two layers that have base layer three, pieces with a height of three layers that have base layer one, pieces with a height of three layers that have base layer two, and finally, pieces with a height of four layers, and they will always have base layer one per definition. All right? And from now on, I'm going to refer to these types of pieces as float types with the reference numbers you see on screen. And maybe it isn't the worst idea if you try to memorize this sequence with these reference numbers as well as the traits that come with each type, respectively, float types 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 have heights 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4 and base layers 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, right? Trust me, it's going to make life easier. Now, in a tiny nutshell, what the decoder does is cycle through all of the floating pieces that exist within the target shape. It's going to analyze how many quadrants exist on each layer of the target shape and then it's going to start cycling through all of the floating pieces that it can extract. It starts by cycling through all of the pieces of float type 1 that are hidden in the shape, followed by all those that pertain to float type 2, followed by those of type 3, then type 4, 5, and 6, in order. And then it loops, alright? Now keep that in mind. Keep this in the back of your head, because now we're going to get to the part that makes the Beastmams decoder worthy of optimization. And the devil is in the details. Here we have a close-up of one of the five clocks. Each vertical assembly represents a cycler that loops through all of the quadrants of any one layer of the target shape. And because a shape can consist of up to four layers, that's why we've got four of those assemblies. Now, at the top, we've got the float type selector cycle. It is going to make sure that we first check for float type 1, then float type 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6. And the way it does that is by acting as a filter that's going to enable and disable or toggle certain quadrant cyclers. So if it is set to flow type 1, for example, flow type 1 being of the bottom two layers of the target shape, then the master filter is going to shut off arrays 3 and 4. If the master filter is set to flow type 2, it shuts off layers 1 and 4. Flow type 3 shuts off layers 1 and 2, and so on. Now, every time the quadrant cycler array reaches the end of its cycle, it will send a pulse back to the flow type selector cycler. It will select the next flow type, disable the appropriate input lines, and the process repeats. And therein lies our problem. That's the flaw. The flaw is that both parties in this symbiosis depend on each other. The quadrant cycler arrays will only start their loop if the float type selector tells them which lines should be active or not. And the float type selector, in turn, will only switch over to the next value if it's received a signal from the quadrant cycler array saying, hey, I'm done with my cycle, it's okay to start the next one. And that process of Having these machines communicate with one another like this takes time because both of them accumulate idle time this way. The both of them each do their own thing, then send out an instruction to the other one and then sit around and wait and do nothing until they get a response from the machine they sent the instruction to. Now, all in all, this communication happens very quickly. As you know, Shapes works with a unit of time called a tick, and the time it takes for an 
end of cycle pulse from the quadrant array to move back to the flow type selector where a new flow type is selected and a new instruction is sent back to the quadrant array so it can start a new cycle. That entire process only takes a few of those ticks and it happens in the blink of an eye. And that's what makes it treacherous. That's why it took me some time to identify this specific area, this particular aspect as the point of entry to making a faster decoder. Because here's the catch. While the communication process back and forth between these two machines might take no more than a few ticks, remember that all of this takes place in a looping mechanism. It's a repeating process. This clock might need to run hundreds of iterations and those measly few ticks accumulate fast, real fast. To be honest, I don't remember the actual numbers, but let's say that when the quadrant array reaches the end of a cycle, it takes five ticks before it receives new instructions and can start cycling again. Now, because there are six float types, we need to multiply that by six. And five by six gives us 30 ticks. And at a frame rate of, let's say, 20 FPS, which is already double of what I currently have, um, and it's roughly what I get if I'm not running any recording software, at 20 FPS, 30 ticks equals one and a half seconds already. And during that time, not a single solution is being checked. This is idle time in which the Beastman decoder does not check any actual shapes. It is time spent on communication. Now, remember, these one and a half seconds, that's the time spent on communication for the first clock to perform one full cycle. And when that's done, it sends a pulse to the second clock and the cycle starts over. And the exact number of cycles that it takes for the decoder to find a solution, that depends on the exact input shape. But let's say that for a given shape, it takes 12 of those cycles, okay? Then our one and a half seconds will turn into 18 seconds. 18 seconds in which the machine does not check any shapes. So the big question is, can we cut out those ticks? Can we somehow close the gaps between each cycle? Well. My friends, the answer is obviously yes, or otherwise we wouldn't be doing a breast map series, right? So yeah, not can we, but how can we? And I'm gonna be honest, cracking that code cost me nearly a kidney and a half, but I got it done and it resulted in this insane behemoth of a wiring setup. Ladies and gentlemen, the breast mam decoder. Alrighty then. Now that we know what the weakest link in the beast maps chain is, we are equipped with the necessary knowledge to start exploring the options for a solution. And we're going to do that as of next episode. I'd say stay tuned if you don't want to miss out. And then I'd love to welcome you again in episode four. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for watching. Peace.